What is going on, gang? This is Exiting Featurette Channel. I'm Chris, and I'm in the old abandoned guest bedroom for a TGIX review. So it's going to be the Omega Man. This is another one that I borrowed from my local public library. Um, you know, I'm going down that wormhole trying to watch some dystopian stuff, trying to watch some predictive programming and see what it's all about. This is based on, this is a 1971 flick directed by Boris Segal, starring Charlton Heston. Uh, you know, I just watched Soylent Green starring Charlton Heston. Uh, really loved that movie. This is based on the Richard Matheson novel, I Am Legend. And I have reviewed another movie that was based on I Am Legend, The Last Man on Earth starring Vincent Price. So check out that um, if you're interested in that. But I saw some definite uh, parallels between The Last Man on Earth and The Omega Man. I have never read I Am Legend, but um, nor have I seen the 2007 Willie Smith film, um, but I think I will in the near future. I definitely do want to read the novel. Uh, I, I will probably just buy it because I'm a big fan of science fiction, and uh, this is definitely a classic. So the general premise of The Last Man on Earth and the Omega Man is that something happened and this person thinks that he's the last man on earth and it turns out you know he's not because there's these like zombies or something um in the last man on earth they they kind of swung it as like they're zombies in this one it's not so much that this will not be spoiler free I am going to talk about the ending because I thought that it was really impactful but you know just a heads up I will spoil it but the general idea for this movie is that there was a biological agent, biological warfare or something that created this virus that basically caused a bunch of people to die uh, very rapidly. And then some, we learn later, that some were just impacted in a different way. And I wasn't really sure what that meant. So to get into the plot, this opens very similarly to The Last Man on Earth. Uh, the Last Man on Earth starts with Vincent Price wandering around this abandoned city alone. The Omega Man begins with Charlton Heston wandering around abandoned Los Angeles alone. And he is alone, but he's carrying a rifle. So you get that dystopian feel that he is the last man on Earth, but at the same time, like, why is he carrying a gun? Like, is there some sort of monster running the streets? There's one part of the introduction where you see something scampering around in a building. It's like a human figure. So Charlton Heston uh, shoots the thing, and we learn that there is something unfriendly that he perceives as unfriendly. So he looks at his watch and says, oh crap, it's, it's going to be dark soon. He rushes home in a car. He pulls into his garage, and then from a, um, a higher level window there's like this cloaked man he's in a black cloak and he just like douses the car with gasoline and lights it aflame and charlton heston like rushes like floors it into the garage and shoots three or three of them i believe so there's a bunch of cloaked people and they're trying to kill him that's all we learn from the introduction it's very interesting so you get the feeling that it's him against everybody else What's really interesting is that the cult, they go by the family, they speak and everything. I don't know if they're like technophobes, but basically they, they reflect on how they destroyed the world. And there is the cult leader, Matthias. He basically like preaches to the rest of the family about how the people before, before the biological warfare agent, um, how they destroyed the world and he says you're you're a user of the wheel and stuff like that you know you and your guns and your your tools and it's interesting because they use like bow and arrow they use catapults they use simple machines but they don't use electricity uh, they're actually with their white eyes they're actually adverse to the light so they have to stay in the dark which is why he had to go home when it got dark because that's when they all come out to play. So these light-hating creatures, you know, they essentially want to bring the world back to the dark age where, you know, we didn't have electricity and stuff like that. And that was kind of interesting how there was like that sim symbolism, you know, just kind of bringing the world back into the dark age. They were trying to kill Charlton Heston 
uh, his character was Bob Neville. He was a military doctor. So they were trying to kill Neville because he represented, they, they perceived him to be the last person on earth in, that was like guilty of the old ways. So Matthias said that killing Neville would essentially kill the last person that was guilty of all these sins that, that caused the end of the world. So the pivotal point, which was basically the beginning of the apocalyptic events, was China and Russia in a war. There was like things on the TV, uh, when is the US going to get involved? very relevant in today's day and age. In the midst of all this, this germ popped up and people began just dying in the streets. The virus or whatever, the germ, it caused people to choke. That was how they died. They, they began choking and then within a couple minutes they would just drop dead. So they declared martial law they declare that everyone has to quarantine, stay in your house, do not travel, do not go anywhere. And uh, that was it. So it, it was kind of like everybody forgot about the Russia-China war and everyone's now just like everybody is dying in the streets. And what's really interesting is in The Last Man on Earth, whenever, whenever people died, they very quickly became reanimated and in the Omega Man, people died, and then it appears they just stayed dead because Charlton Heston, you know, Neville would be walking around the street and he'd see a bunch of like basically mummified corpses. The movie takes place two years after these events. So after everybody died, this is two years later, we get a couple glimpses of calendars in the movie and all of the calendars are stuck on March 1975. So we get the idea, this is two years later, we get the idea this is 1977 or 1978. Like I said, this was uh, this movie came out in 1971, so this is in the very, very near future whenever this actually came out. Um, so I guess it's supposed to be one of those like, you know, like dismal, oh, th this could happen in the future. This is what we could be living. I made a note in my movie notebook and uh, there was a man on TV, I think that he was like supposed to be some sort of a, an expert or something and he was saying is this the end of technological man we were warned of judgment it is here now in the form of billions of microscopic bacilli this is the end so um we were warned of judgment what's very interesting is that this movie has a very religious like undertone to it there's a couple different flashbacks to when this all took place. There's one where Heston is working and he answers the phone. He says something about a test vaccine. So basically the reason that he didn't die is because um, he was supposed to be getting this test vaccine to somebody. He was on a helicopter and the helicopter pilot began choking. So he had the virus. The helicopter started going down and then Heston got started feeling choked up. So the helicopter crashed and after it crashed, Heston fumbled and got the vaccine out of his bag and administered it to himself before, I guess, it took hold and killed him. So he is immune. So apparently the test vaccine was a success. Um, and that is the reason that he is the only person that is immune to this. So there's some scenes where Neville's out uh, getting stuff. There's one where he was like looking for clothes or something and then he heard something he ran into this girl she was like posing like a mannequin and at first he was like is that like really a person um and she like ran up and took off and got away from him so he knows that he is not alone anymore like it's not just him and the family there's like at least another person and it's a cute chick at some point neville's guard is down and they capture him and it's funny because Matthias calls him the last of the bankers and the businessmen. He calls them the users of the, of the wheel and they're going to burn him at the stake. They love fire. These people are pyros, even though they hate the light, they love fire. So he's going to burn him at the stake. And then at the last minute, uh, all these lights in the stadium come on and all the family like basically are scattered and this guy saves him. And wouldn't you know that that girl, the cute girl, uh, is with the guy and they make a grand getaway on like a motorcycle. It was very uh, exciting. So the girl, she's basically like this Foxy Brown character. She's very, um, she has like an afro, very like black power about her. Um, 
she is with her brother Richie who's younger than her then the guy that actually saves Neville he is like just a young man he said that he was going to school to be a doctor or something and then there's a bunch of kids with them like young kids and they theorize that young people are slower to be impacted by the virus but they have seen that uh, other young people have gotten it they said that they can turn like either very slowly or just like within minutes uh, and they turn like their eyes turn color their hair changes color their face like all their skin turns like albino white it's very very weird how they do it so the foxy brown character is named lisa her brother is richie so richie starts to turn like he starts like he starts to not feel well he has a fever he's turning white so neville's like oh well i'm immune let me take my blood and put it into your body and then you will have my antibodies and uh you know you will become immune and then we can share your blood with the other people and they will all become immune and then we will save humanity and that is the idea that's like the big end game and they, it takes some time to do this because he can only draw like a pint of blood at a time, you know, because he's a human. So um, Neville ends up sleeping with Lucy and that was really weird. There was this whole scene like, oh, if you were the only girl in, in the world and I was the only boy in the world. And then they just try to like, you know, get laid. And I'm like, whatever, I guess. It's funny because there's one scene where they're in like a pharmacy and she's like, oh, should I get the pill? There's like this whole, uh, what, did, what did they say? Plan it was a planned parenthood section of the convenience store and it said like birth control pills. There's a picture of like a fetus and I'm like, what the hell is going on here? What were you doing in the 70s? This is a very weird time in history. Just like some over the counter birth control pills, which, you know, they're not good for you. Um, you know, very, very girl power and everything. They're not good for you. It's hard to be empowered when all of your hormones are out of whack. Are you ready for this? What is it? Birth control pills. I made another note that whenever Neville was talking, um, he was drawing his blood and he said, I was a very peculiar doctor in those days trying to find treatments for diseases that didn't exist until other doctors invented them. So uh, he said, now I'm the only game in town. But it's interesting because he just like admits in this movie that doctors are creating diseases. And it's like, you know, that's literally what happens. And this is... You know, I know this is just a movie, but um, that is literally like germ warfare is something that doesn't only exist in science fiction movies and novels. It is something that exists in the world. And I don't know if you guys watch the news, but there was like, you remember how a couple months ago there was like vials of a certain disease that killed a bunch of Native Americans on blankets? That was the vials of this eradicated disease were just found uh outside of some facility like why there's things that go on that uh you and i are not privy to and people just think that like okay let's just trust trust the experts here so that was an interesting quote so dr neville was correct though his his blood worked he cured richie he went back to being black he's all healthy now so um He's like, oh, we got to tell the family we can save them too, because basically the same thing happened to them. We got to save them. And Charlton Heston, you know, Neville knew that they were too far gone and they're just, they're, they're technophobes that just hate civilization. And, you know, I don't think I mentioned this before, but not only were they trying to get rid of Charlton Heston because uh, Neville was like the last man that was guilty of all of these things that created the downfall of society, they were also like burning books demolishing art, getting rid of every piece of evidence of prior civilization ever existing. So it's not like, you know, they can be reasoned with. They are just, they want to wipe out every piece of evidence of civilization existing. So, and Richie's going to go uh, talk to them and say, hey, he can help you. Well, spoiler alert, they killed Richie 
And then Lisa ended up turning and becoming one of the albino family members herself. So then she joins the family, tells them where Heston uh, Neville is hiding, and that's pretty much it. They ambush him. He nearly escaped. He was able to like, you know, get a gun on a couple of them. And uh, he had a vial, like a pint of his blood in the fridge that he was able to save. He made it out. He was trying to get Lisa to go with him and she was kind of reluctant because she's a family member now. So he's trying to save Lisa because the sun's coming up and he is like in love with her now because he got laid once. And Matthias throws a spear and spears Neville in the chest. And it wasn't an immediate death. You know, he kind of laid there for a while before he died, but he was able to save the bottle of blood. So all of the, uh, the kids and the other guy show up uh, a while later. Lisa was still alive. Uh, Neville was basically dead. He was able to give the vial of blood to the guy. And then Heston like died in the fountain and the way he like kind of fell down and like he kind of like slumped down and just died like that. It looked like he was crucified. There were so many, like I mentioned before, the religious tone. There was another time when the young man, the resistant doctor said to Neville, he said, oh, we're gonna kind of create our own Garden of Eden. And, uh, but this time we're not trusting any snake. There was that reference. And then there was also the little girl who kept asking Neville, are you God? Are you God? And uh, Lisa's like, well, let's see if uh, he's a doctor first. So, um, you know, it was kind of like he was their savior. And then in the end, he was able to give the vial of blood to the young man. And it implies that he saved Lisa. And they now know what they need to do. They need to share Lisa's saved, healed blood with everybody else. So it implies that he saved humanity. So it's like he died for them like to further humanity like he's their savior so there was a very strong religious theme in this movie there was also a very it felt very 70s you know i said this was made in 71 it was very modern for its time the music sounded like 70s music the color i mean i feel like all sci-fi movies from that time are all like very drab and dreary and i feel like the 70s palette in general is that way but this was indicative of that. And then also it was very lonely and solitary. So Neville had a, it looked like a bust of Julius Caesar and he had his uh, military cap on it and he had him set up in front of a chess game and he was playing chess with his bust of Julius Caesar. It's just like, you know, it's just like uh, Wilson and Castaway. It's like somebody that is so lonely and isolated that they're trying to have some sort of connection with something else. So you create a friend, I guess. There's one scene where he says to it, uh, you, you know, he used to be a nice guy. <laughs> and it's like, he's really saying that to himself. He's really telling himself, you know, you used to be a nice guy, which is like really, kind of dark. There was also a couple things in that that made me question um, what was really going on. There's one scene where he was in the middle of this vacant city and all these payphones start ringing and it's just like this overwhelming ringing sound and then he just screams to himself there is no phone ringing and they stop and it's like I don't think that, that was a trick by the family because they are afraid of phones that was just probably like his mind playing tricks on him because he was going through something psychologically because he's like so isolated. It kind of made me question like, is he gonna be like the bad guy at the end? Like is, is, is he in the wrong? Is the family in the right for trying to cleanse the world and you know what they're doing? Cause he clearly has some issues. I thought it was kind of weird how they did the wide angle aerial shots of the city because they want to show you that the city is desolate and I get that but there were some that you could see like cars and people in if you like really look and pause it but for the most part so that you couldn't like see things moving they would use like a still photograph of the city so it's like there might be a car but it's not moving. And I get that, you know, people might have died and cars are in the streets and whatever. You could just tell that it was a still photograph. I thought that the motives behind the family were really interesting, you know, um, and they're interesting in general because it's like, 
what what even are they? You know, it, it seems like they're just asymptomatic, but you know, obviously they go through the virus affected them in some way. They go through some transformation. They become albino. They become absolutely resistant to light. Um, so, and it's not like a vampire where they burst into flames in light, but you can tell that they they literally cannot tolerate light. They will, they cannot be in it. So they go through some severe change because of the virus. But then there's a part later on in the movie, like somewhere towards the third act, where one of the family members, they, they mention that one of them died of the plague. So it's like, is this some sort of like transitory stage where you're not like, you're not quite dead, but you're almost there? I don't know. It's also weird how like the kids are resistant, they're resilient, like they don't immediately get it. But then in the end, like they, they will all eventually turn and die is the implication. And then it's like, this is only focused on LA. So how did this affect the rest of the world? Because we know that it was on TV and stuff and we know that it affected everywhere. I think that they said that it affected like other places and other countries and stuff in the beginning. So um, it's just like, how many survivors really are there? And why would this family that is obviously located in Los Angeles, why would they think that eradicating Charlton Heston's character would totally eradicate the like prior civilization? Because that's just one city. Like, you know what I mean? There's other places that people live I, I just don't understand that rationale behind it. I also feel like religion being such a focus in it is like, this was judgment and this is some biblical event that happened. And now it's like people are more focused on, I guess, God, I don't know. They're, they bring it up over and over again. Um, you know, the little girl asks him, are you God? And it's like, she, she's looking for some sort of answer. Um, and it was weird because there's a scene where the kid sees him splayed out in the fountain dead and she just looks at him and puts his hat on the edge of the fountain and leaves it there. And it's just like, she's looking at a dead body, but it's like, it doesn't even phase her because how many must she have seen? It's very cool. Interesting to think about. And this is one of the earlier biracial kisses on film. You know, I know that, what was the first one? The Uhura one in Star Trek? Uh, pretty hot but yeah that was pretty cool it, you know and her Lisa being such a strong uh, black female character like that was very you know very indicative of the time so that was you know relevant in the early 70s it, it had that very um, black power feel to it so that was interesting um, and I guess that the screenwriter Joyce Corrington, um, she was actually a scientist and she worked at a historically black college. And that was, I think, her um, inspiration. Uh, there was actually a um, the introduction. Yeah, there's an introduction on here with her and her husband who wrote the uh, the screen, the screenplay. Um, she said that that was her inspiration for that character being a black female. Um, so that's interesting that she, she took that direction. Pretty cool. I don't know what this is, just the regular Warner Brothers DVD, but there was no commentary or anything on here. The essays and the featurettes on here were very good. I enjoyed them. I've been enjoying getting more into sci-fi and stuff, so um, I figured I watched Soylent Green. Might as well watch this because it's another... Uh, Heston sci-fi flick and I really want to go down the predictive programming rabbit hole because yes I think that this had a lot of that in it you know with the biological warfare agent um, because that is something that you know there are things that will be used to control the masses and I definitely think that is something that will be used to control the masses um, if it hasn't been already. I feel like this is so canonical for 70s sci-fi that it could just like get lost in the genre that it helped create. So 
um, definitely something that you have to watch if, if you're into 70s sci-fi, for sure. I heard that all the adaptations of I Am Legend are very, very different from the book, uh, but I will be going down that rabbit hole very soon. I'll, I'll probably watch I Am Legend, and I will definitely be reading the book as soon as I can. So I guess look for that. Once I read I Am Legend, I'll probably do a uh, like a, another video to wrap it all up. But let me know what you think of this flick. Um, I appreciate you watching this and going on these weird sci-fi adventures with me in my guest bedroom and at the local library. But yeah, thanks for watching this. Come back next week and see what we talk about. I got a bunch of stuff to review from Kino Lorber, so I am pretty stoked about it. I hope you are. hope you're having a great, great May, and I will see you next time.